The topic that we are going to start today is the Mauryan Empire. We have already studied how it was established. So now we will study about how it was expanded. So as you already know that the Mauryan Empire was established by Chandragupta Maurya under the guidance of Chanakya. Now Chandragupta Maurya won numerous fights, numerous wars and after numerous victories he turned towards Buddhism and adopted the practice of fasting. How did he fast? He started fasting till his death. So after the death of him, his son Bindusara Amitraghata ascended the throne. He ascended the throne and ruled from 297 BCE to 273 BCE. When he ascended the throne, Bindusara was only 22 years old. Now Bindusara wanted to carry forward his father's ambition of expanding the empire towards the southernmost region of India up till Mysore. So Bindusara is known to have conquered the land between two seas. Now why do we call the peninsular portion of India the land between two seas? As you can see this land is surrounded by water on two sides. On one side we have the Arabian Sea and on the other side we have the Bay of Bengal. So this portion is known to be the land between the two seas. So Bindusara is known to have conquered this land as well and also he brought 16 other states under the rule of the modern empire. Now with this, let me tell you a very interesting story how Bindusara got his name. Chandragupta Maurya was an emperor and as you know, emperors are always in the danger of being assassinated by their enemies. Same was with Chandragupta Maurya. So Chanakya came with a plan to mix very small portion of poison in his food so that the emperor gets immune to the attacks. Everything was going good, but one day his pregnant wife Darudhara ate from the same plate and unfortunately got ill. Now, in order to save his unborn child, Chandragupta Maurya was forced to get his wife beheaded and her womb was cut open to get the unborn child out. While taking the child out, a drop of blood fell on his forehead and this created a permanent mark. So this is why he was named Bindusara where Bindu means dot and Sara means forehead. How interesting it is that he got his name in this way. Now can you tell me very quickly Bindusara ascended the throne after Chandragupta Maurya. Is it true or false? Yes, it is true. Now this person that you see here is Ashoka, one of the greatest emperor, greatest monarch to have ruled in India. He ascended the throne after his father in the year 273 BCE. Ashoka is known to be very ambitious and he wanted to prove his valor under any circumstances. There is a myth that revolves around him that he killed 99 of his brothers and royal officials to ascend the throne. But it was Ashoka who expanded the modern empire across the subcontinent because at that time India was not in a divided state. It was a part of the subcontinent. So Ashoka expanded his army, his empire across the subcontinent. Now kings fight many battles, similarly Ashoka also fought many battles but he was very adamant and keen on getting the land of Kalinga under his empire. But can you tell me why was Ashok so adamant to get Kalinga under his rule? As you can see Kalinga is on the sea coast in the present day Orissa this is where you find it. So it's on the sea coast. So having this position you can say that Kalinga had control over the sea 
and land trade routes to South India and South Asia. So having Kalinga under his empire would mean that it would bring economic prosperity and wealth to the empire. So this was one reason why Ashok was so so keen on getting Kalinga under his rule. There was also another reason why Ashoka was so adamant on getting this land. As you have known earlier that Kalinga till now was not under the rule of any of the modern emperors. So this was taken up as a challenge by Ashoka to get Kalinga under his empire. So it was taken as a military challenge because Kalinga had not been subdued to any of the emperors of the modern dynasty earlier. Now every war has some or the other result. Someone loses and someone wins. So in the war of Kalinga that was fought in 261 BCE, this war was fought against King Kharavela of Kalinga. But in this case Ashok won and this war caused huge casualties, much bloodshed and millions of life of innocent people were lost. After this, the modern empire stretched towards river Pennar in the south and till river Brahmaputra in the east. Now, you saw why Kalinga was so important. But can you tell me what makes the war of Kalinga so important? The war of Kalinga is very important in the Indian history because it serves as the turning point in the life of Ashoka. How did it serve as a turning point? As you already know that this war caused a lot of casualties, much bloodshed. This sight deeply saddened Ashoka. It is also suggested in the Rock Edict 13 that the site of the massacre moved Ashoka greatly. Now, when Ashoka was moved greatly, what consequences did it lead to? So, Ashoka as a result adopted non-violence and turned to Buddhism. Now, when a person resorts to non-violence. He would obviously have to give up anything that resorts to violence. So he had to give up on war conquest. He would have to give up on the killing of living creatures. So he gave up Digvijaya and Bheri Gosha, which means territorial conquest. And instead of this, he followed Dhamma Vijaya and Dhamma Gosha, which means the conquest through the spread of Moral law of Dhamma. Moral law of Dhamma is the base principle of the religion of Buddhism. So can you now very quickly tell me which modern emperor transformed and adopted Dhamma? Is it Chandragupta Maurya or Kharavela or Ashoka? Yes, it is Ashoka. Now what you see here, this kind of structures are known as stupas. This stupa is called Shanti Stupa or nowadays we also call it as Peace Pagoda. It was built at Dholi in 1972. Why was it built? It was built to celebrate the peace that the Great War of Kalinga achieved because if it had not been the massacre, Ashok would have never been transformed. So this was built in order to celebrate the peace that Kalinga war achieved. And where exactly was it built? It was exactly built where the war of Kalinga was fought at Dholi. Now as you already know that Ashoka transformed from a very ruthless person to a very peaceful person. But how was he different from other kings? Because you must already know about many other kings who were very kind and gentle towards the subject. But how was Ashoka different? Ashoka was different because he led a step ahead. Ashoka created a welfare state for his subjects so that they could lead a happy and a prosperous life. So, in this Pillar Edict 5, you see that it was inscribed over here that Ashok was 
concerned not only for his human subject but also for the other living creatures like the animals like the plants like environment so you can tell here that he was concerned for the living creatures and as well as he was an environmentalist because he believed in the conservation of the environment it is also suggested in the pillar edict 5 that it was decided that on certain days no killing of animals would take place why so as to protect apart from this ashoka also built an efficient administrative system which was very strong because it entailed his personal involvement how was he personally involved he is an emperor how will he personally be involved in all these administrative systems he started touring his empire and spreading the law of dhamma so at that time ashoka got built the lomas rishi cave where in the barabar hills for whom for the jain ajivika saint so this is the time when he assumed the title of Devanam Pia Pia Dasi, which means the beloved of the gods. And this Devanam Pia Dasi was inscribed in the Brahmi script, where on the Lumbini edict. Now, as you have already known how Ashoka transformed from a violent person to a peaceful person. So you must have already has classes in your earlier days of moral education. What do moral education classes teach us? It teaches us to be good human beings, to be kind, to be gentle. So was the principle of Ashoka. But his principles were called the moral law of Dhamma. And when he used to spread it, he assumed the title of Dharma Pravartaka, which means the spreader of the moral law of Dhamma. So what did he actually teach in this moral law of Dhamma? Let's see. Firstly, he urged people to follow Ahimsa, to be non-violent, to not cause injury to others. He also asked his subjects not to harm other living beings, like not to cut trees, not to kill animals for food. So he said not to harm other living beings. He also asked his subjects to respect teachers and elders, irrespective of whatever social background they came from, no matter if they were poor, no matter if they were rich, because everyone deserves respect. So he asked his subjects to respect the teachers and elders, irrespective of whatever background they come from. He also believed in charity. As you know that Ashoka started to spread the moral law of Dhamma, but how will it be possible for one person to educate such a huge masses? Because the modern empire was expanded over a huge land mass. So for this, Ashoka took upon the method of teaching that involved him setting the example. He thought that if yes, I can be the example, my subjects and subordinates will follow me. So for that, he gave up on killing of animals for food. He gave up on war conquest. He gave up on violence. Having said that, you can already imagine what kind of a person he was. So this was a huge achievement. So he wanted to set an example for his subjects so that his subjects could follow him. But it was not always possible for him to tour around for such a huge landmass. So for that, what he did was he got certain messages, whatever he wanted to convey to the people, he got these messages engraved on pillars and on rocks. These messages that were engraved on the pillars were known as the pillar edicts and the messages that were engraved on the rocks became to be known as the rock edicts. There were many carvings that were also made at many places. What you see here is the carving on the southern gateway where of the Sanchi Stupa. Also, can you now tell me what languages Ashoka must have used to give these messages engraved on the pillars and the rocks so that people could understand them? So, he used two languages, Pali and Prakrit, which were the languages of the common people at that time. 
so he used these languages so that it could have been better to understand for the common people now he already got his messages engraved on the pillars carvings and rocks but how would he make sure that people actually applied these principles in their real life so in order to keep a check on that he appointed special officers whom he used to call as dhamma mahamatyas so the function of these dhamma mahamatyas was to see and ensure that the people in real life applied the rules of dhamma these dhamma mahamatyas also ensured that they spread the word of dhamma throughout the empire so that people who could not understand whatever was written so another function of these dhamma mahamatyas was to spread the dhamma throughout the empire because there were many people who could not read or write so for them verbal communication was the only way you must have noticed that during elections political parties use certain vehicles and with that a loudspeaker is attached and a person constantly keeps on saying things and propagating whatever messages they have to convey similarly these dhamma mahamatyas were of the same use they used to ensure that people applied the teachings of dhamma and they were also used to spread the word of dhamma across the empire ashoka was not happy with the teachings to be spread only within his kingdom he wanted his teachings of dhamma to be spread across the world so for that he sent his son mahendra and daughter sangamitra to sri lanka why so that they can spread his word the teachings of dhamma across the world ashoka also held the third buddhist council at patliputra the present day patna in bihar ashoka also sent certain emissaries to certain parts of the world which were far away like syria greece and north africa so can you tell me why a person would not send emissaries to spread his messages to the neighboring countries like china so at the time when ashoka was busy going beyond the barriers so caste creed religion social background and everything china on the other hand was building the great wall of china to keep the pastoralists away to keep the outsiders in check so that they would not be able to invade china when on one hand ashoka was building an inclusive structure to spread the messages of dhamma on the other hand china was building a restrictive structure as you already know ashoka was a benevolent ruler and he gave his kingdom 40 years of peaceful and harmonious life but one day when he was lying on his bed in his old age he was thinking about his children and got sad he sent them to sri lanka his grandchildren were fighting for the throne this scene deeply saddened him because being a peaceful person he was he did not expect this his queen trishia was also plotting against him all these deeply saddened him so to get peace in his life he decided to become a monk so as to meditate and understand the laws of dhamma better as you have already seen what was a dream for bindusara and chandragupta maurya ashok turned it into a reality he brought kalinga into his empire he was a very ruthless person but from being a ruthless person he adopted dhamma and turned to buddhism so can you see how he transitioned from a very violent person to a very peaceful person because the war of kalinga had a very deep impact upon him and served as the turning point in his life ashoka will always be an example for every human for how a person should lead his life because you can see how a ruthless and violent person like him who killed 99 of his brothers and royal officials to ascend the throne turned towards buddhism from leaving war and conquest he started spreading dhamma so he managed to prove that if a person wants to change he can change 
Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon. You can also register for free at deltastep.com or download the Delta Step app and get access to all our 5000 plus amazing videos as per your school syllabus. Master each topic with our adaptive practice technology, get million plus questions with step by step solutions and unlimited mock tests. Get all your doubts resolved instantly. Learn via games and win amazing prizes like playstations and ipads. So at Delta Step, learning is not just fun and easy, it is rewarding too. So register for free now.